Good evening, everyone. How's the sound? Do we sound all right? I could, I could use my Shakespeare voice and drop the mic, but y'all get mad at me. Good evening, everybody. I'm Pano Canellis. I'm the president of the University of Austin, commonly known as UATX, America's next great university. Um, it's my honor to welcome you this evening to what will most assuredly be a very special event, a conversation between two of our country's most important public intellectuals, Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter. While a more fulsome introduction of these two gentlemen will be forthcoming, let me express them my personal gratitude for being here this evening. These are two men that I deeply admire and who exemplify the spirit of joyfulness and intellectual pluralism that is at the heart of our endeavor. Less than two years ago, we founded the University of Austin, an institution committed to the fearless pursuit of truth through free and open inquiry and serious, sustained civil discourse. In a world of polarization and strife, where the zero-sum matrix of power relations seems to be ascendant, institutions of higher learning bear a particular responsibility to be places where productive disagreements and conversations across differences are not only encouraged, but embraced. The purpose of universities is the discovery, transmission, and preservation of knowledge. The reasonable and rational exchange of ideas is the essential component in fulfilling this mission. The habits and practices of civil discourse, therefore, must be foundational. There are three elements to civil discourse. Intellectual humility, a commitment to the unassailable dignity of all human beings, and a passion for truth. The University of Austin is committed to fostering a culture of civil discourse within our institution. Yet with the hope that we might promote civil discourse at educational institutions more broadly and at every level, UATX has embraced Mill as one of our core institutes. Its mission is clear. The Mill Institute works in educational settings to explore and challenge the entrenched thinking that leads to a breakdown of conversation on contentious issues. By convening and training educators, creating learning resources, and conducting research, the Mill Institute helps students become less certain and more curious when it comes to the way they understand the world and one another. The director of the Mill Institute, Ilana Redstone, will be our moderator this evening. She is the creator of Beyond Bigots and Snowflakes, a video series, the author of The Certainty Trap, and the co-author of Unassailable Ideas, How Unwritten Rules and Social Media Shape the Discourse in Higher Education. She has a joint PhD in demography and sociology from the University of Pennsylvania. I sincerely hope that you will be inspired by the spirit of the conversation this evening and will be supportive of institutions like UATX and the Mill Institute that seek to bridge our divides and commit to what is higher and higher education. In a moment, I'll turn it over to Alana to introduce our evening's interlocutors. Uh, just a few words about the sequence of events this evening. Uh, Ilana will introduce our speakers. Uh, we'll have a, about an hour of conversation between Glenn and John, and then about 30 minutes for Q&A following that. So if you have questions along the way, track them, and we'll, uh, we'll be uh, opening this up for questions at the very end of their talk. Uh, now I introduce you to Ilana Redstone. Thank you.
invite my guests to the stage. I just wanted to let everyone's mics get set up. Um, so it's difficult to, and I know Pono sort of suggested this, it's difficult to outline the extensive accomplishments of my guests today. And so I'm going to go forward with my remarks, knowing that they're not going to quite do them justice. Um, Glenn Lowry is the Merton P. Stoltz Professor of the, of the Social Sciences and a professor of economics at Brown University. As many of you know, he has written and uh, spoken extensively on issues of race and inequality. I would say that one of my favorite pieces by Glenn is probably the rebuttal he wrote called I Must Object, published in City Journal in response to the letter sent out by the president of Brown University, Chris Paxson, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. John McWhorter is an associate professor of linguistics at Columbia University. He's a best-selling author, a regular contributor to the New York Times, and an all-around incisive public intellectual on issues ranging from language to race. One of my favorite pieces by John might be from about the same time period in 2020, a piece he wrote on the dehumanizing condescension of white fragility for the Atlantic. As a listener and a reader, I have found John and Glenn to be both individually and in their regular conversations together consistently thoughtful, curious, and committed to understanding various ways of thinking about complex and contentious issues. And so I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to share the stage with these gentlemen. So Pano teed us up already for an hour of conversation and then 20 minutes of Q&A. Um, we will need to wrap up at uh, 6.30. Um, and then we'll need to clear the theater quickly to give, people, to give the space back to the museum. So at the conclusion of the event, we ask everyone to move outside to continue your conversations. So I want to start out, given our topic is affirmative action, I want to start out with sort of a, a higher level question. So, if we start out with saying, with the idea that the issues that we care about, many of the topics we care the most about, are fundamentally morally and ethically complex. And I think we can probably put affirmative action, which is tied to questions of inequality, um, in that category. So given that, we can, I want to think about how to, where to go with this discussion. So one of our goals is to draw out that moral and ethical complexity as a way of becoming more thoughtful about the topic at hand. And so we want to challenge, as again, as Pano said in the introduction, the settled thinking um, or the sort of certainty in our convictions that often leads us to judge and demonize other people or people who have different opinions. Um, and so getting out from under this settled thinking doesn't mean that the right answer always lies in the middle. And it doesn't mean that everyone should just get along. It means that we're making a commitment to interrogating our own thinking just as much as we're committing to interrogating the thinking of other people and question just what it is that we know and how we know it. I'm going to do my best to get at some core tensions that tend to emerge on this topic around affirmative action. Um, I'm not going to ask you to be stand-ins for any particular position. Um, it's more just about having a conversation. So the first thing I want to do is address head on a concern that sometimes comes up when contentious issues arrive. Um, and that is often captured in a quote frequently attributed to James Baldwin, which is, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my, my humanity and right to exist. So this is a quote that people, many people rightfully find powerful. There's power in telling the world Here's my line, and I won't go one step beyond it. Um, and it also says that there are certain things that are just off limits, off limits to discuss. But it can also shut down conversations. Um, and sometimes in a modern day version of this, people would say, well, something like welcoming diverse perspectives is great, except when that perspective is dehumanizing, takes away someone's dignity, or denies the reality of racism. And that is the logic that is sometimes applied around the conversation, conversations of affirmative action. So my question is, and I am getting to the question, how do, you respond, how do you respond to the claim that when it comes to racial inequality, opening the conversation to different perspectives is inherently oppressive or demeaning? Uh, that way lies madness. <laughs> 
No, I mean, you just prejudged the conversation. You just took off the table the thing that we were going to be arguing about. Uh, it, it's a move. It's a power move at the end of the day. It, it's not about truth. It's about control. You see that, game over. I think that um, Baldwin would be surprised at the way that quote is being used. The issue is whether or not a particular argument is denying a person's humanity or denying that racism exists. And it's very rare that anybody would make an argument of that kind. It happens, but that's the easy thing. That's easy to knock down like you know, a duck in one of those things at a, at a, at a circus. In real life, things are subtler than that. And yes, to say that an argument denies one's humanity, um, I don't know if it's a power move. This is a common area of slight disagreement between Glenn and me. I think that there are people who genuinely think that when race issues in particular come up, that there could only possibly be one way to see things, or they so seldom see these things discussed in a way other than claiming that it's all about racism or not, that they have a hard time imagining that there could be such a discussion. They know how to discuss all sorts of things, taxes, climate change, why their last relationship didn't work, but their idea is that when it comes to race, you must think in a different way. People are innocent in that, but they need to be taught out of it. Because the truth is that usually it's not that someone's denying that racism exists or denying someone's humanity. It's an issue of priorities. People prioritize issues differently. And the idea that if someone doesn't prioritize even racism to the degree that you do, then that makes them evil people is sloppy. And I think that people can be made to see that if the argument is a careful one. And of course, if one can have the argument at all. So that's, I, so it's interesting, I, and I think the tension between the two of you on this topic is interesting. Um, Glenn, why? What? Well, how do you know it's a power move? Like, I mean, what? How well, can you? How can you know? No, I want to embed this in the actual flow of history. Sure. Of course, racism exists. Racism will always exist. Uh, people are imperfect. There will be racism. The question is whether or not, in the history of the United States of America over the last seventy-five years, there hasn't been a profound, historic, nearly unprecedented transformation in the status of African Americans at law and in social imagination. That's what's being denied when this card is played. They're telling you, my narrative, not yours. My narrative, not yours. So as I say, if you see that and you say it's not a power move people genuinely believe, the de facto consequence of seeding that ground is that the people who are not willing to engage you on the objective assessment of American history, but rather would have you buy their story about American history, get control. So, I mean, we can talk about rhetoric all day long, but at the end of the day, it's what institutions actually do in response to these demands that is going to matter. And I'm not prepared to cede a sentiment as a substitute for an argument. So, okay, so that's, so let me, let me kind of pull at this a little bit. In some ways, I think that, and I would just want to be clear when we're, when our, we're talking about affirmative action here, and in this, and I know people sometimes define that differently, but we're talking about the preferencing of identity categories like, like race in this case, and admissions and hiring decisions over other non-related identity categories. So it seems to me sometimes that this topic comes down to two basic questions, one, one sort of philosophical and one empirical if we had the perfect data. And the empirical, I'm going to start with the philosophical one. The empirical one gets somewhat to what you were just saying, Glenn. Um, the philosophical one is do we have a moral obligation in either direction, either to focus on identity categories or to not focus on identity categories? And I could imagine running that argument both ways um, when it comes to hiring and admissions decisions? Well, it should come down to this. If you want to divide up the pie and have a certain kind of representation, and that in itself is fine. Once again, the person who would deny that is rare, and yet our discussion of these things tends to propose that that's, that's the typical kind of person. Of course you want to divide up the pie, but the issue is whether or whether or not you want to change what you think of as standards in order to have that representation. 
And one of the tragedies of the way educated Americans are trained to discuss this sort of thing is that what we're supposed to say is, aren't you in favor of diversity and leave it there? As if there's some terrible group of people with pitchforks coming over the hill who don't want there to be that representation. It's 1925 and Senator Bilbo is saying, we don't want black people or Latino people there. And everybody knows that that is an animated cartoon that has nothing to do with what's going on now. The issue is, do you change standards? And maybe you do. And there are articulate reasons for proposing that you do change standards in order to have that particular kind of pizza pie. Like I'm, very, I'm very open to them. So, Like what would be an argument for changing them? A person might say that, for example, black people suffer racism in the abstract in such a way that you cannot expect certain kinds of grades or certain kinds of test scores and that therefore you have to change the, the representation. You have to change standards. Now another person might just as respectably say back, but look at recent immigrants to this country, many of them brown skin, where they don't have any of these advantages and yet they seem to manage to check off those boxes. Then a reasonable person says yes, but they have what's called immigrant pluck, whereas black people have right. been here since 1619. You can keep going. Right. Who's the winner? I think everybody in the room knows what I think. But you can have a respectable argument. We're, but we're discouraged from even going that far. Let, let me respond to yeah. the question, as I understood it, which was, is there an ethical imperative to eschew racial categorization and the allocation of benefits or opportunities? Mm -hmm. Or, or to lean, I would say which, and I would say that the big ethical um, truth, gosh, uh, I guess people will argue with it, so maybe I should qualify truth. <laughs> but the big ethical principle would be treat people without regard to their racial, cultural, ethnic, religious identity, sexual orientation, so forth and so on. Treat people in their fullness of their humanity, equally, equal opportunity, equal treatment. Now, you could argue, I think, for an exception or departure from that principle or that standard given historical exigency. So, in the transition from Jim Crow to an era of more or less equal uh, racial opportunity, you might notice that your institutions are bereft of the presence of African Americans, and you might, as a exception to the principle, as a pragmatic judgment, stand up away from that uh, for some period of time. But you wouldn't lose sight of the principle. So the thing that I object to in the way that the discourse supportive of affirmative action has developed is the sense that um, King's iconic, I have a dream, my four little children, the content of their character, not the color of their skin, is passe. That, it, that it's also 1960s, and that in our current era of diversity and inclusion, that principle uh, is no longer applicable. I think that principle is applicable in spades. I think, in fact, departure from that principle is a permanent way of doing business as a country threatens the integrity and the viability of our republic. We are a multi-ethnic, multi-racial republic. We can't make our laws and uh, ground our institutions in a violation of that principle. So I'm with Sandra Day O'Connor, 2003. That was, in her opinion, in the <laughs> University of Michigan affirmative action cases, I should hope that she makes allowance for affirmative action under the Constitution, under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. I should hope we'd not be in this business in 25 years. Mm -hmm. That's what she said in 2000. 25 and 0. Um, so, so it seems like, so one of the questions that seems to come up, and, we, and again, as I started us off talking about some settled thinking and sort of things that we take for granted. So one question it seems like is, what function do you, and, and you brought this up, John, in your, in your remarks, do standardized tests in, this, in the case of admissions, right? What function do they serve, right? And so what does the signal to noise ratio look like in terms of how, how useful those are? Because if you think that, they're, that they have value, then it's hard to argue, right, to get rid of them. So then the argument has to be made to undermine their value, I think. And is that sort of what, is that what you're seeing? Um, yeah. We have to remember that those tests were created in order to make us 
get beyond our biases and just have a relatively objective metric of evaluation. And nobody ever thought that SATs were perfect. And of course, one has to allow that there are biased questions on the test, and that's something people started talking about 40 years ago, and now those... This was the yacht question. Right, you know, what wine goes with chicken, you know, well, <laughs> all of that is gone. And nevertheless, it would seem that, um, for example, black people and also Latino people, on the average, aren't as good at those tests as some other people. I think there are socio-historical reasons that make that almost inevitable. But today's idea is that you call the test racist because of that disparity, and therefore get rid of the test for everyone because apparently the test was imperfect. But there is a willful anti-intellectualism in that view because no one is required to say, how is it racist? What is it about being a black person that means that you don't have this ability to fill in these bubbles and answer these logical questions. And if anybody says, well, are you saying that black people aren't as intelligent, they get sent to live on another planet. So apparently, <laughs> that's not what it is. So what is it? And we're not supposed to talk about what it is. We're just supposed to say it's racist and therefore get rid of it. I cannot express how utterly disgusted I am seeing universities get rid of that requirement. Mm. If somebody wanted to make that argument, and I think they're dueling studies as to how effective the SAT is, and what it all comes down to is that they're rather effective at, producing, at predicting how well people are going to do. If you want to get rid of it, fine, but don't get rid of it because black and Latino people weren't as good at it. I find that to be, and this is what you're not supposed to say, but I find that to be an embarrassment, and I'm proud of my embarrassment on that. The idea should be, as Roy Wilkins, as Marcus Garvey, as W.E.B. Du Bois would have thought, the idea should be, how do we get our kids to be better at the damn thing? The fact that nobody after 1966 wanted to ask that question is a black mark, so to speak, on the zeitgeist of our times. I'm, I'm utterly disgusted. May I add yes, something? Yes, please. Well, because it's not just the SAT, it's also the GRE. And it's not just the GRE, it's also the LSAT. And it's not just the LSAT, it's also the MCAT. Now, there's information in people's performance on these instruments. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect predictor of anything. But there's information. Uh, it's a measurement. It's a piece of information. It happens to have a disparate impact on identity groups as they perform on the instrument. Nobody has demonstrated that the instrument is any more or less effective in predicting the performance of a student based on the student's race. That's not in the literature. It's not like black students outperform what you would anticipate they would do based upon the test, and hence you unfairly disadvantage them by including the test. The test measures more or less accurately people's mastery over certain kinds of intellectual performance. Now, you get rid of the test. You get rid of the test in order to accommodate the interest of 10% or 15% or maybe 20% of your student body. But you're not using the information for anybody now. You're mucking around with the foundations of your institution. You're changing the meritocratic standards that you employ for everybody, for everybody. You've put your institution on the chopping block. Your pretense of uh, selectivity and exclusivity and intellectual uh, excellence has been sacrificed. And sacrificed for what? For failing to acknowledge the information that the messenger is bringing you about a subjecti an objective social reality. This is a mistake. You want to do something for the black kids? Develop their intellectual performative capacity so that whatever the instrument is that's being used to assess people, they do better at it. The information in the test is that those people are not yet reaching their full human potential. I stand with John. I don't think there's anything fundamentally barring African American youngsters from competing effectively in any of these venues. But the fact of the matter is that we are not, our children are not competing effectively in many of these venues, as is indicated by the best instruments available to us to assess that matter. So it's a mistake to shoot the messenger. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's part of it is to what extent do you view the sort of any any instrument or mechanism that reveals disparate outcomes as an in, sort of is that an indication that there's that it's a, that, the, that the cause of those disparate outcomes is fundamentally structural or driven by racism, et cetera. And so, to, in other words, let me phrase that differently. But no, excuse me, yeah. Ilana. That's not my argument. No, no, no. I, no the, yeah. the, the cause is not the point. The mm -hmm. point is the consequence. That is to say, if they haven't developed, then that's what we need to know when we come to ration access to elite programs. The reason that they haven't developed, well, might entail racism, and it well might imply fundamental sh changes in social organization. But it doesn't imply reorganizing the academic programs that we depend upon for the advancement of our technical and, uh, knowledge and so forth over the environment and everything else. So no, I'm not denying that when I see kids with different scores, it well may be that this one had a tutor, this one's parent was wealthy, this one did not grow up in a housing project, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Those things all may be true and they may be implicated in the disparity, but the disparity itself is real. Mm -hmm. Right, no, I th thank you for that clarification. So let me ask a different question. So to what extent so, or let me put it, sorry, to the extent that people on both sides of this issue care about racial inequality, um, and feel free to disagree if you think that that assumption is itself wrong, um, where do you think that they part ways? Well, actually, Alana, it's the thing that you, you started to say, <clears throat> where especially these days, the left is encouraged to embrace an idea that if there's any kind of disparity, between, for example, white and black, or white Asian on one side, black Latino on the other, then it must be due to something called racism, with kind of a capital R, and you're not supposed to look too deeply into what the racism consists of. Whereas I think that many people on the right are impatient with that argument. Now, are some people on the right the kinds who say, stop stirring all of that stuff up? Yes, that's an unreflective position, more common among the less educated. But there are people on the right who are quite enlightened, who just feel that that use of racism is basically not shining as much light on the issue as one might think. And so, for example, the Washington Post ran a truly egregious article um, last week about Shaker Heights, Ohio, and the problem with um, black kids' performance in schools in Shaker Heights. And they ran this article when about 20 years ago, all of this, 25 years ago, that situation was very carefully covered. The Washington Post article basically implied that there must be some kind of racism involved, that the teachers must be subtly biased against the black students in some way, that bias must be why black kids are so rare in the advanced placement classes. That's just the common wisdom today, and I remember thinking if I were 18, I would read this article and take in that that's the way it is. There wasn't a single mention of the fact that the black Nigerian anthropologist, John Ogbu, who passed away youngish and so he can't defend himself now, but he did a study in Shaker Heights, a very sympathetic study where he interviewed legions of black families, and he showed that among black teens, there often is an attitude that to do well in school is not just nerdy, so it's not like Martin on The Simpsons, it's that you are disloyal to your race, which is a nastier charge, and it tends to make black kids pull away at a time when they be, would be acquiring the skills that Glenn is talking about. He wrote a whole book about it. It went into paper. The paperback was cheap. There was a documentary. Now that there's YouTube, you can see the documentary online <laughs> with black male teenagers saying straight up, I was told it was white to do well in school, and my grades went down. I remember this. The Washington Post article said nothing about it. That was absolutely egregious, because that's not an honest debate. The person on the left says it's all about racism. The person on the right often knows that there's proof that things are more complex than that. And I'm not going to talk any much longer than 15 seconds, but the reason that that black boy feels that way is not because he's dumb. It's not because there's something wrong with him. It's because he is a legacy in a way of what happened when schools were desegregated for real in the 60s and kids met genuinely racist teachers and kids. That, in 1966, is exactly when black kids started thinking of school as white. That's a terrible thing, but racism in Shaker Heights, Ohio, 10 minutes ago is not what's creating that problem. I don't want to cut you off if you wanted to add something. No, no, I, I had my say. Um, so well, let me ask, I saw one. <laughs> So here's a question. Um, 
to what extent, and the answer may be not at all, but to what extent do you think that sort of where things break down on this topic is fundamentally tied to the ways people think about the following question, which is how, uh, there's a couple different ways you could phrase it, but let me try it this way. What percent of US adults are racist? Like, I'm not saying you should answer that. I'm just saying like that the different ways people think about that question, that you can trace a lot of this to that. To mm -hmm. what extent do you think that that's an accurate way of thinking about it? Uh, I have no idea. <clears throat> I mean, I, I would like to respond to that yeah. question, but I, I don't have any knowledge base from which to draw in that. Uh, your earlier question, I think I would like to make a comment yeah. on, which is what, what's really, do they disagree about the people who are yeah. on different sides of this issue? And I think um, what it really comes down to at the end is what are the purposes of the university? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you say the university is, in effect, is basically, I mean, there are books around there, lectures being given, but basically it's a social club <clears throat> where kids uh, get a union card that allows them into the upper middle class of America. They get through the door. They get uh, access to power. They get privilege. They get to the top of the pyramid. And therefore, if you're the custodians of access to this portal which, through which you must pass if you're going to be a player in American society, you are obliged, given American history, to ensure that there's a diversity of ethnic and racial and uh, identitarian uh, composition in, in your charges because you are, in, in effect, the gatekeepers to who's going to be running American society. And we're better off to have that be a diverse cadre. That's one view of the university. Gatekeeper to the elite access to power, privilege, et cetera, stamping the approval that allows a person to be a player in society. If that were the purpose of the university, I'd be four square behind trashing its standards in the service of making sure that it uh, provided access on a more or less equal basis to people of various groups. But I will go down swinging on the point that that's not the purpose of the university. The purpose of the university is to cultivate excellence. It's to pursue truth. It's to push the frontier. It's to develop the finest and the best. It's to remember the finest and the best. It's to codify. It's to enshrine. It's to canonize the finest and the best. Now, that's me. Call me an elitist. Yes, because these universities, the ones that are selective, and most are not, most are barely able to keep the lights on and they take everybody who comes through the door. But the ones that are selective, the ones like the one that I work for, where you get 35 or 40,000 applications for 1,800 slots, are in the business of cultivating the finest and the best. And if that's your understanding of what the university is about, you're going to have a very different view about affirmative action. And that is what I think separates people at the end of the day, at bottom, on the respective sides of this debate. Ilana, in answer to your question about the racism issue, you know, and of course we don't need to know how many or how much, but it's there. And another thing that being educated teaches you not to ask in this country is how much does racism of that kind matter? Mm -hmm. And so yes, it's there. You can find it if you look for it. Does that keep a group down? Now if you're talking about the kind of racism that black Americans encountered in 1942, the answer is obvious. It's been a while. What about racism now? So for example, I don't spend as much time on Twitter as some people, but I spend some time. And a couple days ago, I saw this person who's, he's after us, Glenn. I don't know who this person is, but he, um, uh -oh. he wrote, um, what, what was it? Some obscure basketball coach somewhere in Georgia, some white guy, put some things online that are openly bigoted, including the N-word. Some little slob, some guy. So this person, he's one of these who doesn't like us, and so he, he has something on there every day lately, and he said, can't wait to see Glenn and John argue this away. You know, this is I straight up. I saw that. You saw him? <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah. And so I went and actually read the story, because I thought, what is it that we're going to argue away? Well, no, you can't argue that guy away, but was that person somebody who is keeping any black person from doing what they want to do? And frankly, I don't see that it is. We're supposed to suppose that whenever you see evidence that there is bigotry, then therefore the hard left view of how race works is somehow confirmed. And not only is that, frankly, a sloppy argument, 
but it, it's wrong. It doesn't make any sense in terms of history. And many people would say, well, it's different for black people. If you were the descendant of African slaves in the United States in the early 21st century, somehow it's different from any other homo sapiens that have ever lived. I say, prove it. And of course, nobody seems to feel that they're responsible for doing so. And here we are. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, Glenn, going back to your comment about the university and sort of what it, that you're, you sort of set up these two possibilities in terms of the orientation of a university, I imagine that the president of your university, probably the president of my university, would probably would try and make the argument that those two things are not mutually exclusive. Um, and so how would you, I'm not saying you have to buy that argument, but how would you respond to that? Well, I would deny the claim. Mm -hmm. Mutually exclusive, that's pretty strong. Can I find areas in which both diversity and excellence can be advanced simultaneously? Yes, I can. Might there not be uh, problems, uh, blind spots, uh, conventional ways of doing things that actually don't uncover the diamonds in the rough, which could, with effort, be overcome and at the same time make the university more excellent and more diverse. Yes, I concede that. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about huge disparities in the academic performance of students by race being admitted into some of the most elite venues of academic competition on the planet. That's what we're talking about. And when people get down to cases, they say, I'm going to run an engineering school without the GRE. They say, I'm going to run a law school without the LSAT. They say, I'm going to admit an undergraduate class to a selective institution without benefit of knowing how people perform on standardized admissions tests. That, I'm saying, is going to compromise the a mission, as I understand it, of the pursuit of excellence, it's going to water down the integrity of judging the performance of people in the institution. Because look at this. You admit by race with different criteria of assessment. You're going to get different performance by race after admissions if you use different criteria of assessment, so long as those criteria are correlated with performance, which they are. So you create a circumstance in which you're going to de facto have differences in performance amongst the elite cadres in your university. How is that going to be accommodated? Are you going to humiliate the students who are performing poorly by maintaining your very rigorous grade standards and so forth and so on? Or are you going to make compromises in order not to reveal the consequences of what you do? You're going to do, if evidence is any guide, the latter. That compromises what I say is the principal purpose of the university. So I mean, I think I have a proof. Uh, the proof is criteria of assessment correlate with performance. Different criteria of assessment are used to admit black students and others. Ergo, different performance among students post-admission. Then what? Then we honestly acknowledge those differences and attend to them? That's very very difficult. In fact, you could argue that the, and I'll stop. Yeah. What was that, 15 seconds? <laughs> you, you could argue that the issue of freedom of expression and inquiry in the university is compromised by the fact of affirmative action creating ex post facto this circumstance that I just got through describing of different by race performance of students. Because anybody who says it, Ask Sandra Sellers of the Georgetown Law Center, a lecturer who was fired from her job and pilloried for saying into a hot mic that she didn't know was recording that the kids at the bottom of her class disproportionately were black. Ask Amy Wax. Anybody who actually says it is going to be uh, hung by the thumbs. Uh, that's not free inquiry. That's another indication of what I'm saying, which is that the university, this precious institution, this is high culture that we're talking about here, is being compromised in the pursuit of this uh, demographic representation. I think it's a mistake. You know one person who got away with um, writing about what happens when you admit black students under different standards? Somebody who actually got away with it? It was me. It was 25 years ago. <laughs> and I wrote in my book, Losing the Race. I was writing in 1998. It was published in 2000. I wrote about that. And I got away with it because I'm black. 
And that meant that, you know, you can't get rid of me because then you're a racist to fire the tenured <laughs> black professor. And, you know, I'm going to recommend something because it's been a while. I'm in a whole different phase of my life. A lot of people didn't like that I actually wrote about the students and what it was like. I was one of them. You didn't like it then. And I wrote about them with full compassion. And frankly, I changed all of the genders. I gave no specifics. But I wrote about what this was like, because I thought it will never be on record what it's like on the ground when there is a two-tiered system. I felt bad for the students. I was angry at UC Berkeley. I'm still angry at the UC Berkeley of that era. And I just want to say something for anybody who's watching this, you know, for you, you people out there in the dark, so to speak, I don't mean in this room, but people watching this online, Losing the Race, Year 2000, Chapters 2 and 3. And you will see somebody who could actually sit and describe it without being chased to another planet. And I'm still here on Earth. And you'll see that it was a tragedy. And I'm worried that we're about to reproduce that with this fashionable idea that now nobody is going to be submitted to a test of abstract cognitive skill because testing black people on abstract cognitive skill is racist. What have we come to? What have we come to? So I think that's, that's interesting. First of all, I just wanted to clarify when I said my, my own university is sort of, I meant, the, my, I meant my tenure home at the University of Illinois um, as opposed to, sorry, as opposed to UATX. And I think that part of that ties to, um, part of it ties that I think, Glenn, this, it sounds like this is part of your frustration. And, and John, this is, it actually speaks to what you were talk, just talking about that you were able to say in your book all those years ago which is sort of an honest engagement with sort of, if we're going to make this decision, we have these goals, we're going to make this decision to, in this case, you know, change standards or whatever, and we have all of these justifications, here's what that's going to mean. And sort of when, and so part of the frustration, I think, is a sort of unwillingness to make contact with that that is what's going to happen. And that's, it sounds like what you were able to do in your book in chapters two and three. Mm -hmm. It was actually chapters three and four. Okay, three and but, four. Um, I'm correcting myself, but yes, it needed to be out there. And some yeah. people thought that I was just being mean. But no, I was writing in compassion to show that something wasn't happening that needed to happen. And the old policy was not good for anybody. And yeah. I think that, frankly, empirically, it stands. I think people should, should continue to look at those chapters. Right, I mean, at some level, it's one thing to sort of tweak things in the honest, or sort of change standards, I guess, to more direct way of putting it, and being clear about what that means, and sort of having an open discussion about what that means. It's another thing to say, okay, we're going to do this, but we're not going to talk about the fact that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so let me, let me switch gears a little bit to uh, this idea, this question of representation. And John, I know you wrote about this not that long ago for the New York Times. What dri so one of the questions around affirmative action, or one of the arguments, is has to do with this idea of um, well, I guess two things. One is diversity being a good of its sort of just being a good on its own um, and having an, a value sort of uh, um, on its own. And the other idea is this with representation is this, that there's a benefit to people seeing, people seeing other people in positions of power and authority that look like they do. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can speak to that idea, that people need to see people who look like them in order to feel inspired or accepted or motivated or whatever. And so does that, how do you think about that? Okay, I'll go first. I mean, there's, there's a social scientific proposition, I don't know, of psychology or something like that, which would uh, turn on the question of whether or not individuals are motivated in their own um, aspiration and behavior by identifying with others that they can see along certain dimensions that look like them. And then we could try to measure that. I'm not qualified to address that. I don't know the literature very well, so I'll, I'll leave that to others. Um, but I want to I want to step up a minute from the question and ask, what do we look like? <laughs> uh, we're all created in the image of God goes a certain line. So there, I suppose, what we're looking at is not the texture of the hair or the shape of bones in the face or the color of the skin. We're looking at something about the intrinsic humanity of the person when a person says we're all. Is, is that what we're supposed to see? Are we supposed to see another human being? Looks like me. Um, male, heterosexual. Uh, do I have to see someone who is over 70 years old before I can take inspiration <laughs> from their behavior? I, I don't mean to make fun of something, because there's a very important message here when I tell a kid, if you don't see another black person, you don't have any inspiration. I'm telling them that this is what they are. 
that's not what they are. Who are they supposed to identify? They're supposed to identify with other Africans? Or are they supposed to identify as the most privileged young people on the planet with others who have this great privilege? Are they supposed to identify as American citizens? Are they supposed to identify as Christians, Jews, or Muslims? So uh, I think it begs many questions to put that in that way, to see others who look like me. And I think the reflexive answer is a bean count. I've seen enough black lesbian women that I know as a black lesbian woman that I'm in a place of belonging, trivializes the great questions of who are we? which is what you come to a university to learn how to explore. I never understood that line. I, I never got it. The, the, idea, the line about I need to that see people who you look need like to, you. You need to see teachers who look like you. You need to have other students who look like you. I had to be taught that that was the way I was supposed to feel. <coughs> I know what I look like. I can look in the mirror. I had parents. They were, they were black, too. <laughs> I had, had a family, had friends, mostly when I was a kid, black friends. I didn't need to see black people in my books. You looked at TV, and by the 70s, there were enough black people, probably not as many as now, definitely not, but I didn't miss it because if I look somewhere, I don't want to see me. I want to see the world. I want to see something else. I don't go on a walk in the woods in order to see blackness. I go in order to see a squirrel or a <laughs> creek or something. I don't look at TV thinking, I want to see people doing things that my relatives do. I, I've seen my relatives do it. You want to see <laughs> something else. And yet, no, that's, that's not right. And I know that there was that Times piece. I don't read the comments, but in this case, I didn't need to. Every second comment was, John McWhorter thinks he's so special. He thinks he's so smart. He likes teaching himself languages, but that's not what everybody's like. But no, no. <laughs> That business that to be a curious black person who doesn't need to see themselves is somehow disloyal, that's only lately. Because in, say, 1932, you couldn't see yourself in popular culture, and black people just dealt with it. Your blackness was you and your life, and then you went and you saw a movie like Dinner at Eight, and that was pretty much all there was, and no one really complained. Of course, it's better to have the representation that we have now, but that idea that you're, you're being deprived by not seeing yourself in your education, in your popular culture. I'm reading a book right now where there's this wonderful chapter on Du Bois. He would have been horrified. Yeah. He's learning German. He's talking about Kant, et cetera. Right. Nobody told him that he wasn't black enough. That didn't come up. The only people who said that to him, frankly, were white people. And yet here in our post-1966 age, you have that line. I've never heard a Chinese-American kid say it. You know, they don't, they don't need to see Chinese-ness in their teachers. And they weren't saying it even when there weren't so many Chinese-American students around them. And I know that because I went to college when there were very few. That's something that black people and Latino people are trained to say. And I don't know if we really believe it. Or if we're that afraid of white people, we can't be comfortable until we see one of our own. Again, nobody was told to think that way until 1966. Here, Glenn, I think it's opposed. It's a pose that we're encouraged to take. White people make me nervous. I need to see black people. No, white people don't make you that nervous in 2023. You're told that you're supposed to say that they do because it gives you a sense of identity. But it's an act, and it's a dangerous one because it stanches curiosity. And curiosity is what makes a human being human. OK, I, I want to do this thing that I do when John and I talk, which is steel man and try to see if I can. Articulate. It's all yours. The oh, this best, is going to be like we're doing one of the. the side. Side. Okay. <laughs> so I am a black lesbian woman. Say, that's not a joke. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, counterfactual, but suppose so. And I'm wondering whether the institution is accommodating of people like me because I have encountered in my life rejection and prejudice and racism and hatred and homophobia in other settings. And I wonder whether or not I will. And my anticipation of that ill treatment can paralyze me. It, it causes me pain and discomfort. It keeps me from doing the best that I can do. So I look up, and I see that there are a few black, lesbian, openly identifying people like me who have positions of influence in the institution. I feel more comfortable. And in that comfort, I can relax and be myself. I can 
stop balling my fist up and shooting myself against anticipated injury, and I can flourish. And so if the institution wants people like me to feel comfortable in their company, then what would be wrong with accommodating my desire to see someone within reason who looks like me? Something like that. Um, so, well, it, black, yes. black lesbian. I, I understand where you're coming from, and certainly it's better if there are people who you feel are one of your own around you, definitely. But if you really are balling up your fist, if you're really that uncomfortable when you don't see people like you around you in our times, as opposed to a distant day in our times, if you're that uncomfortable, then there's something dysfunctional going on, and you need to find some kind of compassionate help. Now, these days, we're supposed to feel that when it comes to race and identity issues, I'm not supposed to say that. I'm not supposed to say that you need to be trained out of that reflexive crouch. But no, I see no exception at all in the 21st century, given the sorts of things that you are likely to face, or I should really say, not face. I don't see that you need to be that nervous about not seeing yourself in this setting. And given that you're going to go out into the world and find that people like you are rare in many settings that you're going to go into, I think you should be prepared. Life is not always comfortable, and that's part of what college is for. So with all compassion, I say, if you're that nervous, then you need cognitive behavioral therapy that will make you happier, because you're not always going to be surrounded by people like you. It actually makes me think that your example, your, your attempt to steel man that position, which is great, um, Glenn is so good at that. You are very good at that. <laughs> um, you kind of proved your own point in the sense that that y the you know you're putting on the hat of a black lesbian in that like part of the problem you said you were saying just a few minutes ago that it's a question of how we fundamentally see ourselves. So the fact that she feels that way is fundamentally at least in part a result of the way that she has internalized to see herself in, in right in this hypothetical person, and so it is. Her, her existence is a result of the problem that you just defined a minute ago, right? Yeah, and uh, <laughs> cognitive therapy, I mean. CBT works. You know, I'm, I'm you mentally go, ill. You go 16 <laughs> times and you're a new person. <laughs> it seems to me that this issue, which could be raised in many settings, it could be raised in an employment setting. You come into a company and you look up and down the corridor and you don't see anybody who looks like you. You don't know if you're welcome there or not. Is especially important in the educational setting about the pedagogy, about what do you read? You know, do, do I read books by people who look like me? What do you study? Do I study languages that are spoken by people who look like me? Um, and uh, who are your heroes? Are my heroes restricted to people who have a biography that parallels my own? Can I get out of my own time? Can I get out of my own century? Can I commune like Du Bois did? How does he put it in Souls of Black Folks? Uh, he wince. admires Shakespeare, and Shakespeare winces not. You know, uh, I may be an outcast amongst the Jim Crow segregated uh, Americans whom I have to encounter on a daily basis, but let me sit with the master Shakespeare. Let me get command of the English language. Let me make it my own. And he winces not. And I am more fully realized as a human being when I do so. I mean, I don't think James Baldwin, for that matter, restricted himself in his reading of literature to black authors. I don't think Ralph Ellison, for that matter, uh, was concerned mainly to devote his intellectual development by attending to the things of people who looked like him. And I know that wasn't true about Frederick Douglass. I know it wasn't true about uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, and so on and so forth. In other words, bottom line, suppose your goal is to advance the well-being of the race of people who look like you. You inhibit yourself from realizing fully your potential to advance that goal by restricting your attention to the doings of people who look like you. And I would add also to someone who's listening to us and thinking, Yes, but those were people from the past. Most of the pictures are in black and white. That's a long time ago. They're smoking and drinking martinis. And here we are now, and it's different. And so a modern black person is supposed to only read Alice Walker and Walter Mosley, even though they read Tolstoy. They were old-fashioned. No, that doesn't cohere. That doesn't make sense. 
the only way that would make sense is if racism is worse now. What is it that we know now that Ralph Ellison didn't? And I think only a serious partisan would deny. Racism is not as bad now as it was in 1950. So we can afford even more than them to read Joyce Carol Oates as well as Gail Jones, et cetera. Not less. And so if W.E.B. Du Bois read all over the place, we can even more. Lynching was legal in the prime of his life. We live in very different times. So we can't reject those people because the photos are black and white. It's better now. We have a widened opportunity. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, at some level, the question of representation itself, how we think, what we look for in representation is a reflection of how we see ourselves in the first place, which is, which is going back to what you were saying earlier. So, um, OK, so let me ask a question. Our, we have this, our title here has to do with fairness for our conversation. So what does it mean for something to be fair from the standpoint of supporting affirmative action? And what does it mean for something to be fair for somebody who is opposed to it? Because both, I do find that both sides in this conversation will invoke the same word about fairness. And so obviously they're using it in different ways. So how would you, how do you think about that? Well, I, I don't have anything deep to say here. It seems straightforward to me that the people who are in support of affirmative action believe that the instruments of assessment that uh, exclude, if used without regard to race, uh, African Americans from, in large numbers from these institutions is unfair because the background conditions that lead to differences in performance by race on those instruments are themselves unfair. And that prior unfairness is merely ratified by the selective institutions when they use test scores and grades and so forth, but don't use race as an admissions process. Uh, that's what they're saying. They're saying exclusion is unfair because the conditions that have produced the exclusion are unfair. Um, for the uh, working class immigrant family in the Lower East Side of New York or whatever it is who gets into the Stuyvesant exam school based upon doing excellent on a test <coughs> whose parents are foreign born uh, and who wonders why it is that they can't get in uh, because of the quota that has been put in place to ensure that there are enough quote unquote underrepresented minorities present, they're going to say I played by the rules and you cut me out. They're going to say, I did exactly what I thought I was supposed to do. I worked hard. I studied. Uh, I mastered the craft, the command of, I took, made command over the material at hand. I demonstrated that command. And then he slammed the door in my face. Manifestly unfair. So I that, think that was that's a deeper hard. answer than you thought, than you think. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that that family is not wrong. There is no slam dunk answer to that immigrant family who feel that way. And one solution to it might be, that changing the standards can be a moral advance for a society, but that it's time limited. So the question is whether you change standards like that until racism doesn't exist and racial disparities don't exist at all. And that is a complex and difficult question, but that Vietnamese family who say that they feel shut out, they're not wrong. And it may be that there comes a point when we start not telling them that they can't be in large numbers at Harvard. And to claim that that position is denying that racism exists or is anti-black or is self-hating, once again, it's, it's simplistic argumentation. It's not argumentation. And unfortunately, that's the way we're encouraged to see an issue like affirmative action. Right. So let me, I want to ask another question. One of the arguments that comes up, or one of the points that's made sort of on the topic of affirmative action also has to do, and we've sort of touched on this a little bit, with this question of writing past wrongs, right, and sort of correcting for historical injustices. This is you know, one of the arguments that's, that's invoked. And so what, if any, obligation, I mean, you could see how this would kind of bleed easily into a reparations conversation as well, but what, if any, obligation do you think that this country has to write past wrongs? Well, in the context of affirmative action. You could, in any context, but sure. Oh, I mean, there's an easy answer. Uh, we should take the responsibility where possible to address ourselves or to the redress or the correction of, of past wrongs. But I think as a practical matter, uh, that's, you know, uh, 
Yeah, the reason I'm hesitating here is I don't want to say there's no obligation to redress past wrong, because one could enumerate any number of cases in which you thought that some kind of redress was required. But in the context of affirmative action, I, I think that's whatever we wanted to do, the wrong site to be trying to do it. Um, and we're, I've already said what it is that I think, the reason is that I think this, but um, I, I think that if you wanted to address yourself to past wrongs, the entry gate into elite institutions at the end of the developmental process where you're dealing with people who either have or have not acquired mastery over technical material that is uh, essential to the further advance of their uh, education and so forth. My idea of the university, that's not the site. So I'm, I'm dodging the question. Maybe you do want to address past wrongs to some extent, but not with university admissions. Maybe we have addressed them. There's another perspective. Pull the camera back. Affirmative action starts in the 60s, and poor black students were brought into elite institutions, the idea being to redress past wrongs. That was an experiment that largely didn't work, but it was worth trying. And when it became clear that that didn't work, then a very fragile argument about diversity started being used, especially in the wake of the Bakke decision in 1978. The idea that diversity is key to a good education is very thin. Everybody knows that, strictly speaking, it doesn't quite make sense, but we pretend. And maybe that was redressing past wrongs. And that argument has been used now for decades. And black students are in elite institutions in healthy numbers. And you know, pretty soon it's going to be 50 years. Maybe we have redressed past wrongs. Our way of discussing race has a way of not allowing that anything ever actually happens. And so for example, if reparations were granted, I think of any kind, no matter what it was, within the bounds of the reality that we live in, the idea would be that it was only just the beginning. Mm -hmm. It would not make a blip in the national conversation. It couldn't because we are supposed to think that racism is always an ongoing problem. So the idea is maybe affirmative action and various other programs have redressed past wrongs. And the truth is most human beings live in the present. And that includes black American human beings. We are often spoken of and we're taught to think of ourselves as if our whole history, our whole being since 1619 is a single person that somehow black people never exactly die, that we embody our entire experience since the early 17th century and we're still feeling it. I'm still feeling the lynchings. I'm still upset about things that actually happened to my great grandfather. That's great for opera. Uh, that's, that's a great book, but that's not how human beings feel. My feelings are based on my memories starting in roughly 1970. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's true of most human beings. So. No, I think that, oh, Let ahead, me sorry. mention Ilana, yeah. uh, because I think this is important. That when that Bakke case was decided in 1978, we were just with Ted Shaw, the lawyer at the University of North Carolina Law School, who was a uh, head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund we? for many years and advocated in court right. for some of, these, uh, some of these cases. And he pointed out that the court had an opportunity to certify the use of affirmative action as an instrument to redress historical mistreatment of black people. And it elected, he thinks, erroneously and tragically not to do so and to rest the case on diversity, which is a pretty thin ground on which to rest that case, as I think we're getting ready to find out. There's so much, um, there's so much more to say here. There's so many, we could, I, we could go on and on and on, and there's just a lot here. Um, it does seem like there are interesting questions, and I, think we're, I know we're going to transition to the Q&A. But in particular, I feel like we've almost come back to this question about sort of how we think about, I, I, had put, I had phrased it as, you know, what percent of adults are racist or something. But these assumptions, you could phrase it, you could put it differently. What is the ambient level of racism? Or what are the, what are the main causes of inequality? Right? And that these questions that people, that we fundamentally sort of come at very differently. And some of them could be empirical and some of them aren't. Um, so I know we need to, this has been great. So thank you both. And I know we're going to do about 30 minutes of Q&A. So I think that would be, this is a good time to transition to that. I think we're bringing up the house lights. So we can do <laughs> I think we have um, we have two UATX. We have Kaya over here and Audrey over here. With Audrey, do you have a mic too? Oh yes. Um, 
And so if you have questions, just raise your hand or somehow, and we'll, and I will do my best to repeat questions so that everybody can hear to, if we don't get the mic. Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, Perfect. sort of related to what Glenn was saying about uh, with the university being a place where, you know, the, the canon happens, more or less. I'm sorry, where what happens? Where, 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 where or, or the conception of the idea of a university is a place for the canon. For you know, for what counts as intellectual insight. My question is, if you, I, I would like for you to say a little bit more about the sort of initiatives and incentives that drive academic research and how that conditions canons and how they get formed over time, because you know, coming from the humanities, there there is a sense in which it's a little more ambiguous what counts mm -hmm. as canonical and why, and that gets changed over time. And I think that you could actually make an argument that it's when it comes to, let's say, graduate admissions. Well, when those, when those que What is your question? My, my, <laughs> my question is, it's already, it, it's always been perfectly fitted in terms of the, the canon selects for what is most popular at the moment. And so we're living through a moment where it's simply changing. And we can't say that it's better or worse. It's simply different. I'm sorry, but that's not a question. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> what? I'm just trying to make it easier for him. Sure, sure. Yeah. My, no, I get it. I, okay. I, I, I get it. It's, it's an observation that we construct as we go along the criteria of assessment and judgment that we regard to be what is canonical and what is excellent, and that there, there can be disputes about that, and that that is not a fixed thing. And I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not a literature or humanities guy, so I may not have my I's dotted and T's crossed on all of the Pierre Bourdieu that I need to in, bring in here in terms about what creates distinction or the Michel Foucault that I would need to cite or the Jacques Derrida that I would not want to overlook. Uh, that's not my thing. Um, I would retreat to this ground. I would say whatever the various currents that are going back and forth that are influencing the evolution of the canonical. Racial identity in and of itself shouldn't command uh, attention. You shouldn't be able to say, I'm black and therefore. You, you should have something more to say. Now, if you say, I'm reading Toni Morrison and I'm learning a lot about it and I don't see that on your reading list and you really need to put it on your reading list, we could have an argument about that. Something like that. I think they're trying to go from one side to the next. First, I just want to thank you both so much for um, all the work you do. And as a public school parent, I'm distressed about the extending the soft bigotry of low expectations. My favorite phrase from a, from a uh, president to everyone, which is what's happening in New York City public schools. I was, I was thinking about when you were talking about um, there are explanations for the discrepancies in performance that are cultural, economic, et cetera. But I was thinking about a, a book I read about premature birth, and it had one chapter entirely on race, arguing that the maternal mortality rates and infant mortality rates of black women in America are disproportionately high, and that even women, black women from other countries that had healthy birth experiences elsewhere, once they come here, it becomes the same. And that there seemed to be no other researchers looked into it, and there were no other arguments besides racism. And I wondered if you had thought about that. Those things are real. I mean, I think that probably if you looked at that, you could see that it had something to do with a tendency to suppose that black people tolerate pain better or to not listen to black people's self-reports about what they're going through. All of that is real. It is tragically predictable of the way human brains work, and especially in this country. And so it's important not to start taking a, a whack-a-mole approach to these sorts of things and thinking, how is it not racist? There are things that make it very clear that racist sentiment does exist, and it tends to have impact in ways that are subconscious, but nevertheless powerful. Now, I would say that 
that, as hideous as it is, does not explain the issue about the standardized tests. And so to look at the standardized tests and say, that's racism too? No, I, I would separate those things. But that sort of thing is real. And I think part of being an educated person is to try to resist it and to check yourself for it as much as possible. Now, to regard those sorts of things as evidence that to be white is to carry the original sin of white privilege and to nurture a theatrical sense of guilt about it, I'm not sure what purpose that serves anyone. But still, yes, those biases do exist and they can have effects. There's, there's nothing to, there's no point in trying to deny it. It's real. I'm assuming everyone can hear the questions just fine. OK. Right. Thank you, professors, for your time. I had a question on the view of the purpose of the university. Um, Professor Lau, I think it was you who said that the main belief that separates the two camps on the affirmative action issue is the question of whether the university is a cultivator of academic excellence and of truth, or it has just become a fast track to the American elite class. Um, I'm with you in saying that it is, in fact, a cultivator of academic excellence, but how might one respond to someone who takes sort of a realist position, saying that even if the, ostensibly the purpose of the university is to cultivate truth and excellence, that it's become a fast track to um, the American elite? Yeah, I'd say there's a deep, uh, rich vein to, to mine in that, in that consideration. Let me invoke Justice Antonin Scalia, the late Antonin Scalia. He says to the lawyers for the University of Michigan during oral argument in those cases back at the turn of the century, he says, um, you know, you don't have to do racial discrimination in your admissions policy in order to be diverse. You could just not be as elite. You could, you, you could not be as selective. You could change the mission of what you're trying to do. And they, I, I could say that to someone recruiting uh, interns at Goldman Sachs who will flood the campus at Brown University to interview our undergraduates, all of whom want to take finance courses so that they can be you know, on the list to get hired at Goldman Sachs. I could say, why don't you go to the University of Rhode Island? Why don't you go to the University of Connecticut? They've got plenty of smart people over there who are doing finance. No, 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 no. You want the sons of the wealthy elite who you know have been vetted at, because they've gotten into Brown and they've gone to private schools here in New York City and their parents are very wealthy and you know you want people who are like you when, when you make your hiring decisions. And that makes a place like Brown a portal to get into a place like Goldman Sachs as an intern if you want to have a career in that field. And it needn't be so. So I'm, I'm sorry not to be more concise. The demand for admission to the portal is, a, is derivative from or parasitic on the behavior of people after the portal who are going to be deciding. And if they didn't put so much weight on this uh, credential of elitism, it wouldn't be such a vital matter that the admissions people uh, engage in racial discrimination to create a level playing field by race uh, in, in the, in the uh, you know. So is that, is that I'm, just, just I'm sorry, did I, did I address your question? Uh, yes. Okay. So is that, are you essentially saying that the labor market is using, is using the elite institutions as functioning as gatekeepers or sort of some, uh, in that sense? I'm saying that the premium on the credential is partly a social artifact. Mm -hmm. It's not an objective thing. And I'm saying to the extent that that premium is there, there will be a demand to make sure that all kinds of people can get into the institution in the first place. So in that sense, I was trying to agree with the spirit of the question. Mm -hmm. You know, there's another answer to that, which is that um, that's one of those where we're expected to just nod. You have to go to Harvard in order to have those particular kinds of connections. I may have missed something, but is there a study that says that if you went to Lehigh, or if you went to the University of San Diego, or you went to any number of excellent state schools that are not on that list of roughly 42 selective ones, that you are barred from making those kinds of connections or getting those kinds of jobs to such an extent that it is 
a national tragedy, that it's a social injustice. Has that been shown? Because there are people, and I'm not, I'm not aiming this at you personally, but for example, you go to Lehigh, fine school, um, Villanova. Okay, there are people there whose jobs it is to shepherd seniors into good jobs in the world. They're paid for that. Are those people not good at their jobs? Or would they say, we simply can't do as well as Yale? I doubt it. Or, this is the thing, has anyone ever checked? And so I think that we're being manipulated by that idea that you have to change standards because that's the way that people become captains of industry. I've never seen proof of it. And proof is not looking at captains of industry and seeing that there are disproportionate numbers of Ivy League students. Disproportionate, yes, but how much? How much would it hurt you to go to Lehigh or Villanova? Are you it's talking a question. about some sort of like some, some earnings comparison across institutions? For or across example. Across tiers of institutions? Mm -hmm. And that how much of an earnings dis I'm sure that's been done. And, I don't know what and that the thing is, if the earnings are somewhat higher, is it to an extent that is a social injustice that needs to be fixed and that therefore well, is that's, worth changing that's standards? That's a different question, right? And that's a question. Right. I'd like to know uh, from both of you how you've seen, if, I'm assuming you have seen the the culture within the classroom change over the past 20, 25 years. Maybe this is more for Glenn than you. Oh, wait a minute now. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's been around for 25 years. I started teaching in 1994. So yeah. Uh, well, this is me or you? I, I, I'll say I'll say that I think. Um, Kids are cautious. They're, they're, they're very mindful of uh, saying something that is a little bit offbeat, uh, a little bit out of line with the prevailing zeitgeist, um, and they're cautious. I mean, I find myself writing in my comments on the term papers that are submitted to me, and I'm the only one who's reading the paper, I often find myself writing, why didn't you say this in class? You know, they make a really interesting, subtle point and I say, wow, that would have really prompted discussion if you had just said it in class. Why didn't you say it in class? So that, I think, is definitely a part of the current. I mean, they are literally aware that they could tweet something and it could ruin their lives. That wasn't the case 25 years ago. It happened um, for me specifically in 2014. Suddenly there was this huge sea change exactly that year. And I used to teach um, contemporary civilizations at Columbia, which is kind of philosophy and poli-sci. And it's a discussion class. And I had one class where it was the Sisyphean task to get a real discussion going. And to be honest, that's not usually a problem that I have. But with this class, I couldn't really get it going. There was one I had to end 15 minutes early because they just wouldn't talk. And I gradually realized it's because of two and a half students who basically shut down anything that gets interesting based on this new notion of social justice. And I stopped, t stopped teaching that class. I thought, I don't want to teach this if we can't talk about real things beyond roughly Plato. And I miss it, but it was because of a certain new sea change. I changed to music humanities where the issues are less politicized and so you can have real discussions. But yes, something has definitely happened. The students are scared to death. And yes, they'll write about something, but they wouldn't have said it in class. And I would say 99 out of 100 of the things that we're talking about are perfectly innocuous things, which I remember well students would openly discuss in classes like that in the 90s. There's been a huge sea change. Over here. I've got, yeah, hi. Uh, quick question about Clarence Thomas and the ProPublica report. I know the topic here is <coughs> and his treatment has sometimes been a subject Professor Lowry, I'm wondering if you have any reaction to that news. Uh, okay. <laughs> so um, my understanding of the uh, disclosure requirements is that the justice wasn't required to report the in-kind uh, gifts that he had received from Harlan Crow when uh, accepting invitations to this or that event. I don't think there's any way, I mean, this is just a common sense answer. This is not a political or legal answer. It's a bad look. It, it, it is a, it's definitely a hit. And uh, I think the justice is going to have to find a way of uh, effectively uh, responding. 
Uh, I thought that Mr. Crow's uh, statement, which was quoted in the ProPublica piece, where he said, this is my friend. I'm generous with my friends. He's not the only one. We don't discuss anything that's a business for the court. There's really nothing wrong here. Everything is above board. Um, was OK as far as it went. But um, you know, it's a bad look. So I'm from India, and uh, we've had affirmative action there based on caste, not race, since the conception of the country. And uh, it was supposed to be a temporary thing for 15 years post-independence, but it, it still exists. And there are, of course, pros and cons. Uh, there are students who get into elite institutes based on affirmative action. And as you said, the performance is uh, in accordance with how they scored, um, but also they face there is a discrimination still uh, despite the affirmative action because everyone knows who these students are and they themselves feel separate. However, as a pro, they do, um, so now you can only avail this affirmative action for one generation, so once the family gets it, elite education, a good job, and then they're uplifted, and then the family is at par, well, economically with the rest of the non-affirmative action people. So I, my question is, what can we learn and from this model that has been in existence for 75 plus years and how can it be applied here in America in the context of race or if there is anything, any parallels or anything that we can learn and like what should be done and what shouldn't be done? Um, this is gonna be, have to be our last question as we're winding down here. So I'll let them respond. The question is what can we learn relevant to the United States discussion of affirmative action from the experience in India? Um, do I get it correct in recollecting that some of the upper caste uh, Indian students who have been rejected from universities because of affirmative action have self-immolated in their protest? Uh, some of them, yeah. Sorry. I mean, it's a extremely sensitive political issue, is it not? Do I not um, get it correct when thinking that some of the other backward caste uh, have been attracted politically by parties because they could get the benefits of affirmative action. It's become a kind of way of uh, bestowing patronage on people in uh, return for their votes. Um, so I would, uh, Thomas Sowell has a book, Affirmative Action, A Worldwide Disaster, or something like that. Affirmative Action Around the World, but that's what he means. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so I think, you know, the dark side uh, of some of the things that can go very badly wrong in a society that institutionalizes this practice uh, are um, revealed uh, in the Indian experience. I don't dare to try to say that that therefore implies the U.S. would this or that, but I think you can look at the Indian experience and come away with certain uh, cautionary tales. So I want to just close out here with one final question. Um, and if I can make a shameless plug and put you both on the spot, um, what do you see as the value of conversations like the one that we're having on this, well, on this topic and other contentious topics? Um, and by extension, sort of the work of the Mill Institute, as I've described it, which is sort of unpacking complex topics with teachers and students in our education system. So what is the value that we're adding? I was, um, I was a fac brat when I was a kid. And so I grew up around my mother teaching college students. And even when I was, say, 10 or 11, I noticed that the students going through these four years were not coming out knowing what the capitals of the states were and knowing what mitosis was, et cetera. They were smart people, but I couldn't help thinking they're not becoming nerds. They're not being stuffed with information. That's not the point. And I asked my mother, what is the point of them spending these four years in extra school? And it, it wasn't skeptical, but I was just saying, how come they had to keep going to school? What are they learning? And she said, they're not learning what the capital of Minnesota is, but they're learning that issues are complex mm -hmm. and that the answer to anything interesting is not just all I know is. She said, it's the... Um, my mother could be pretty tart, but I think she was usually right. She said, what most people do is sit around agreeing with each other. If you listen to conversation, especially with, among people who haven't gone to college, what everybody does is sit around and find points of agreement. When you've gone to college, 
then you learn how to not agree. And she said, frankly, it makes conversation more interesting. She was dead on there. And so the point of a discussion like this, whether it's about affirmative action or smoking or <laughs> mitosis, <laughs> is that you expand your brain by understanding that in the real world issues are complex and that you can see things from various sides and that both sides might be correct and that that is also true when the issue is something along the lines of social justice or race or gender. It doesn't suddenly become different because of those issues. That to engage the world, to have some fun with your brain before you pass away at the age of 82 probably, is no, to learn... No. Oh, go ahead, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Glenn, that was terrible. Before <laughs> pass away at 112, you. is that you want to expand your sense of what engagement is. Glenn, I am so sorry. No, man. No, no. Glenn, you get the last word here to close us out. Go I'm wherever you'd like just with fine. it. My liver, my kidneys, my heart. All You're going to be with us for 300 years. So. <laughs> we'll see about that, and I should be knocking on wood somewhere. Yep. Uh, so, okay, there are two kind of answers, it seems to me. One is that you open the Overton window a little bit, you know, you, you, you clear the air, you, you engage in a discourse that inspires others to continue to talk, and somehow, collectively, we learn, and that's one kind of answer, and it's very idealistic, and it's probably right for many subjects, and probably not right for some subjects. The other kind of answer is it's a waste of time that uh, how many troops have you got it, that we're going to fight it out? The court is going to make a decision. How did the court get to a position where it was getting ready to overturn affirmative action? That's what matters. Mm -hmm. What matters is what is the law? Who makes the law? They get appointed. That's politics. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's about power. It's about politics. It's about who decides. And hopefully, those decisions will be informed by rational deliberation. But you know, uh, I have been at this for a while, and I don't know how many minds I've changed. So we'll you see. You might be surprised. We'll see. You might be surprised. You, if you, I, you might be surprised if you actually knew, you, or even okay. about if it's not about changing minds, just opening them. So, okay. Well, I want to thank our guests um, for their time. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming.